The second part of our trip over the Tynanweir Metro will see us travel over the Yellow Line between South Shields and St James via Monument and Whitley Bay. Today's brand new station opened on the 4th of August 2019, replacing the first metro station which reached here from Heweth in 1984. Typical of metro termini, there is only one platform road available here for trains to reverse easily back to Newcastle, although the tracks do continue ahead to the three sidings. Immediately after leaving the station, the line becomes double and remains so for the entirety of the journey, excluding the section between Jarrow and Pelor. The route we are on was promoted and built by the Stanhope and Tyne Railway, a mineral line that carried limestone from the Stanhope quarries to the docks here at South Shields. There was also freight trains loaded with coal from West Consett, in addition to a passenger service that started on the 19th of June 1839. The first station we encounter is Chichester, referred to locally as Chai. During filming, metro trains were running non-stop through Platform 2, owing to signalling constraints being put in place while building work was carried out on the new South Shields Interchange station. Despite being spelt the same way as the city in the south of England, the pronunciation is very different, with more emphasis based on the Chai section. In common with South Shields, the station had closed in 1981 for conversion to the metro, opening to South Shields from Pelor on the 24th of March 1984. We arrive at Tyne Dock Station, served by steam trains since the preliminary of the line way back in 1839, for which we know that trains continue to Brockley Winds and southwards to Washington on the Leamside Line. The train standing at Platform 2 is for Newcastle. The junction was located here, where trains from South Shields, the Tyne Docks and Brockley Winds all interconnected with each other. Our path now digs deeper, to burrow into a small tunnel beneath the line carrying the route to the Docks and Brockley Winds. The most recent addition to the Tyne and Weir metro system, Simonside was built at a cost of £3 million and opened on the 17th of March 2008. 
there had been mixed reviews on the arrival of the new station, as residents voiced their concerns, saying that the station would lead to an increase in crime and make the roads more congested. The wide bridge takes us under the busy A194 Newcastle Road. This is Bede. The area takes its name after the Venerable Bede, who was a monk living in the 7th century St Paul's Monastery. The station is close to the J. Barbara and Sons clothing factory. Bede station is comparatively new, unlike Simonside. Yet the route along here was opened way back in 1872. This cut-off route via Jarrow and Hebburn was built by the Northeastern Railway, laid as a double track from the outset. Just beyond the A19 bypass, the line now becomes single as coming in from the right is the network rail freight only branch line from the Jarrow oil terminal, which parallels our route to Pedal. An accident occurred here which resulted in 18 people losing their lives. It was on the 17th of December 1915 when an early morning freight train operating in thick fog was detached from its banking engine as the gradient was severe during that time. The train had pulled out onto the main line and continued with the driver unaware of the peril ahead as at this time the banking loco became stationary on the junction. Despite all means of communication to the signaller, this failed and the 0705 passenger train bound for Newcastle ran into the back of the loco which telescoped the front two coaches and to consume them by fire. A sad story indeed. The long section of single line for the metro ends momentarily for the passing loop at Jarrow. The network rail tracks continue as a single route skirting around the back of the station. We resume single line working. After the announcement that a metro system was to be in place in 1970 by the Tyne Transport Board, a new signalling system was installed doing away with the old BR semaphore signals. The control centre is responsible for the entire metro and are based at South Gosforth, for which the control centre also supervises accountability for the electrical supply. In addition, the centre can communicate with the drivers of trains and station staff with two-way radio equipment. The centre has been upgraded and was refitted in 2018.
The staggered platforms of Hebburn, even though the original of 1872 had the same arrangement. A relic of the past that is still here, with this old trespass sign placed by BR in the 1970s. Between Hebburn and Pelor sees the longest stretch of stationless track on the entire metro system, being well over one and a half miles. It is Nexus's plan to replace the ageing train fleet that have been in constant operation since their introductory in the 1980s, as they have inevitably suffered with increasing problems including continuous breakdowns. It has been Nexus's spirited aspiration to replace the current class 994s by 2021, but if this is not achieved, they have said that widespread cuts will have to be made for peak time services. In September 2018, five companies have been selected to bid the contract to produce the new fleet. These are Bombardier Transportation, CAF, Hitachi, Stadler Rail and a consortium of Australia, Downer EDI. Currently the Metro is electrified on the overhead wire system, not of 25 kilovolts AC, but on a scale down voltage of 1500 volts DC. The Metro cars are all fitted with their own Becknell Willis High Reach pantographs in order to collect the power from the overhead lines. The line now resumes its double track infrastructure all the way to St James. The network rail line now joins the Durham coastline at Pelor Junction. During this time our route connects with the Green Line from Sunderland and South Hilton. The yellow line services now follow the course of the green line through the centre of Newcastle to South Gosforth. This uniquely allows us to see the route in the opposite direction as far as South Gosforth. Pelor opened in 1843 and by 1850 became a junction with the Newcastle and Darlington Junction Railways route to Durham on what was known as the Leamside Line. Passenger services ceased in 1963 though remained in use for freight until 1991. As a quick refresher, the Durham coastline was formed by an amalgamation of small self-governing railway companies, some that challenged each other for traffic such as passengers and goods. Eventually this all changed when the North Eastern Railway linked them all together to form the vital coastal route we see today in 1905. The adjacent double track on our right was built by the Brayling Junction Railway on the 30th of August 1839 to Monks Wearmouth to Newcastle Central.
this is Hueth, the terminus of the Metro on the 15th of November 1981 from Haymarket. It provides the interchange with the Durham coastline and a modern bus station which was established next to the station entrance. The British Rail Station opened in 1979. The Durham coastline sees an hourly service provided by Northern, running to destinations such as Hexham, Middlesbrough and Nunthorpe. Services are provided by two-car diesel multiple units, mainly class 156s or 158s. This section of the Metro opened on the 15th of November 1981 from Haymarket. While today we recognise the Metro as having two routes, simply identified as the green and yellow lines, in recent years there used to be a blue and red line. The red line used to begin at Heweth, later to Pelor, and ran as far as Benton, whereas the blue line operated between St James and North Shields. The Tyne and Weir Metro became the first railway in the UK that uses a metric system. This means that all speeds and distances are presented in metric units only. The only exception to this is the section between Pelor Metro Junction to South Hilton, where mileposts are measured in miles. In this case, they are measured from York. The Metro has a very distinctive design and identity, so it can be distinguished from the discrepant rail system it first replaced and to match the livery on local buses. The eccentric black M on a yellow background denotes the Metro system on cube signs positioned outside stations, like what the London Underground do with their roundels. British typographer Margaret Vivian Calvert is the woman responsible for this unique identity of the metro system. Her typeface lettering is now correspondingly seen on signage, maps and stations themselves. Out of the 60 stations on the metro, they all vary in character from being important railway stations built from the 19th century to others being from the time of the adaptation of the metro in the 70s and 80s. Opening in 1981 with the start of the Metro services as Gateshead Stadium, when first proposed, the station was originally planned to be called Old Ford, taking its name from a nearby residential area. Today, the International Stadium, which is principally used for athletics, has lended its name to the station. Behind the trees, the DCL now parts company to run into Newcastle Central Station by means of the aptly named High Level Bridge over the River Tyne. We descend downwards as we prepare to run underground for the next few miles to Jesmond.
Gateshead Station is in fact the only Metro Underground station not to be located within the city centre. The service intervals on both lines during daytime services are every 12 minutes, though this section with both green and yellow lines rises to 6 minutes off peak. The time taken between Airport and South Hilton takes roughly 67 minutes, however the yellow line takes 82 minutes all the way from St James to South Shields. The service operates between 5.30 until midnight and closed on Christmas and Boxing Days. As the main city was established on high ground, the obstacle now faced for the metro was the River Tyne itself. With no option of going deeper underground, the railway had to cross it and so we now emerge into daylight to cross the river by means of the Queen Elizabeth II Bridge. Managed by the London North Eastern Railway, trains provide the half hourly service from London King's Cross to Edinburgh, with certain trains extended into northern Scotland. Cross Country also has a presence in Newcastle, with its long distance rail services to as far south as Penzance to as far north as Aberdeen. Other TOCs are Transpennine Express and Northern. Our first visit to Monument, that takes its name from the 130 foot high column which is positioned above the station dedicated to Charles Grey, the second Earl of Grey back in 1838. The Metro's yellow line is unique to pass through the station twice, known as a pretzel configuration. Only three such other railways in the world have this pre-arrangement. They can be found in The Hague, Netherlands and in Sofia, Bulgaria. There used to be four pretzel railway stations in the world, but in October 2016, the Millennium Line in Vancouver, Canada ceased to have this status.
The first terminus of the TWN, Haymarket is situated right in the city centre, being close to the universities of Newcastle and Northumbria, as well as the civic centre and bus station. In 2006, the station was completely refurbished, costing £20 million with brighter lighting and interiors and installing new escalators. The station handles up to 6 million passengers every year but annual ridership has increased over the years to 36.4 million people using the metro system in 2017 and 2018. The end of the tunnel is now in sight as we arrive at Jesmond that had platforms on the former Blyth and Tyne railway route to Newcastle Central. It had opened in 1864, three years after the line itself that opened in 1861. The main station still survives to this day selling spirits rather than tickets in the delightfully named Carriage Public House. Coming in from the right is the previously mentioned BTR route to Central Station, nowadays used for empty rolling stock to reach Manor's Metro Station and the sidings there, more of which later. The lines in the Tyneside area were one of the first in the country to be electrified in a response to the early tramways of the period. The Tyneside electrics as they were known started in 1904 on a scaled down voltage of 600 volts DC third rail system using special NER electric multiple units. South Shields hadn't been reached by the third rail system until 1938 completing the whole route from north to south. Yet now under the control of BR, this marked the end of the electric services in the 1960s, as it was decided to convert the routes to diesel operation. As a consequence to this, the passenger traffic declined immensely as trains had become slower and dirtier, a massive backward step that had not been foreseen. Coming to the rescue was the Tyneside Passenger Transport Authority in 1971 
and after many studies and projects, formed the run-down railways into the metro system we see today. This was the first stretch of the Yellow Line to open between Haymarket and Tynemouth on the 11th of August 1980. The distinctive black footbridge of 1864 has been saved and still sees the busy flow of commuters on a regular basis. It is also one of the main train crew depots. The building adjacent sees a heavy staff presence entering and exiting the building all day long. Incidentally, from 1864 to 1905, the station was known simply as Gosforth. The Green Line diverges to the airport. Before the North Tyneside Loop, the route through here was built by the Blythe and Tyne Railway Company, incorporated in 1853 and opened in 1861. Over the years it expanded in size and strength, extending their routes out towards Ashington and Morpeth to get their hands on the prosperous mineral traffic. So successful it was that a local passenger service had soon commenced and by 1874 was absorbed by the NER. However, the BTR retained its individual identity during this period. As is the way of things, the coal traffic eventually declined in the 1970s. This also included passengers and mineral traffic accordingly. Business had hit an all-time low. The British rail system was identified as being the poorest transport system in the country, one of the main reasons for being held back of the region's economy. The decision was to modernise the routes around the Tyneside area, with certain old stations and bridges being swiftly converted for a rapid transit system. We've arrived at Long Benton. The station predates the current metro station, opening in 1947 by the LNER during the North Tyneside Electrics.
The station here takes its name from the junction at Benton Lane, Benton Park Road and Front Street. Once a historical crossroad with traders, cattle drivers and the transportation of local salts and lime to the docks. Outside the station itself is the four lane ends interchange with regular bus services departing to destinations towards Killingworth, Morpeth, Newcastle and rural Northumberland. Benton occupies the site of the original 1871 station. Another square junction used to be here for the northbound and southbound freight and more or less to an extent passenger trains to connect with the east coast main line. We cross the main line on this bridge. The 393 mile long line runs from Edinburgh to London King's Cross at an average journey time of four and a half hours. We are now joined by the freight only Morpeth avoiding line as far as Northumberland Park. The line had originally been built by the Blythe, Sedge Hill and Percy Main Railway on the 28th of August 1841. It was a few years later that it merged to become the Blythe and Tyne. The Blythe and Tyne line now passes beneath us so it can appear on the left hand side. Palmersville station opened six years after the investiture of the Metro. The train standing at platform one is for South Shields. Little mention has been made of the motive power in the early days of the BTR. Steam was naturally the main mode of propulsion to transport goods and passengers to their destinations, with locomotives being formed of either 240 or 060 types. After 1904, when electric multiple units were introduced, steam autocars comprising of a Fletcher BTP044T engine formed of two coaches 
ran exclusively between Monks Eaton and Shields, in addition to a shuttle service over the Avenue branch from Blythe to North Shields. We pass under the A19 for the third time. At the time of filming, Northumberland Park was just 14 years old, ceremoniously opened by Professor Tony Ridley, the first general director of Nexus, on the 11th of December 2005. Closed in 1977 was the site of Backworth Station, located immediately to the west, being demolished in preparation for the construction of the Metro. The Morpeth avoiding line now deviates away from us towards the north. Although passengers had been withdrawn over the route since 1964, there have been numerous attempts to reinstate a passenger service to Morpeth and Ashington, with intermediate stops at Bedlington, Newsham and Seton Delaval. This announcement was made 10 years ago in 2009 but never say never as you never know what the future may bring to the people of the North East. 2017 was the last recorded announcement by the government who had considered reopening the route to Ashington. The area we are now travelling through is Monks Eaton. Rail had served what was at the time a small village since 1864, 
but was granted a second station in 1933, three quarters of a mile away from the first to serve new housing. It was called West Monks Eaton. The station entrance has a reinforced concrete Art Deco facade designed by H. H. Powell for the LNER. Today the station building still stands along with the LNER platform canopy, being refurbished in 1999. Just before we arrive at Monks Eaton, we pass over the site of the original station and traverse the site of Monks Eaton Junction, with the previously mentioned Avenue Branch to Hartsley, opening in 1860. It continued onwards to Tynemouth, but with the growth of housing and holiday making, the route from Monks Eaton had been superseded from a course we are now taking today, running closer to the sea. The line then became a through route, after realignments had been improvised by the government and duly opened on the 3rd of July 1882, thus creating the familiar coast railway of the metro we see to this day. Five years later, Monks Eaton was one of those built much larger and grander, reflecting its status to the travelling public as a seaside resort. branch line would have left us here to run to Colliwell Bay, which in fact did start running services as late as 1912 to that area in optimisms for a new housing estate to be developed. During World War I, part of the track had to be lifted to aid the war in France and to be recycled elsewhere. The track had been reinstated, but the cost of repairing it further was seen as an inconvenience so the LNER abandoned the line in 1931. Whitley Bay still retains its traditional canopy reflecting its importance to the town as a seaside resort, the sea only being a stone's throw away. Even to this day, the bucket and spade hordes come gushing out of the station towards the beach. The distinctive station building, including the clock tower, were given Grade 2 listing in 1986. The original station of Whitley Bay was sited 600 yards to the west of the present station, the move occurring in 1882. Arriving at Colour Coats, we pass beneath the wide footbridge that is an original feature to the station.
The first station located inland was opened in 1864, closing in 1882 when our route was pushed out to the sea. The station is largely unaltered from opening. Another grand station here at Tynemouth, once again reflecting its size and status as a seaside destination. The ornate Victorian station, with the ironwork adorning the NER and its canopies, have both been graded to listing. Twice in its lifetime, the station has been the terminus, firstly for the Blythe and Tyne Railway in 1860, and secondly the first terminus of the Metro on the 11th of August 1980. This was just for two years, the last part of our journey to St James via Wall's End opened for Metro services on the 14th of November 1982. We now leave the former territory of the Blythe and Tyne Railway behind and enter the area once owned and functioned by the Newcastle and North Shields Railway. Their origins lie back in 1830 when it was first proposed for a railway to be built between Newcastle and North Shields. This had been vehemently opposed by people in the area, fearing the city's docks would lose their trade and the probable death knell to the seaside resorts. With all that time and fuss, the company were given the Royal Assent in 1836, with work pressing on straight away to open on the 18th of June 1839. This route to Tynemouth, however, was extended in 1847 
resulting in the tunnel underneath the town which we shall shortly pass through. On the other side of the river is where we started our journey at South Shields, an almost full circle. The current metro station was reconstructed for the conversion of the rapid transit station in 1982. The N and NSR station was of course the terminus of the line in 1839, calling their station Shields until 1874. The bay platform on our left once turned back certain metro services when they were a part of the blue line, originating from here and terminating at St James. Now on the original path of the Newcastle and North Shields, it's fascinating to note that the line had been built in total isolation to begin with. The constructors hadn't overseen the obstacle that lay in their wake, such as the two viaducts at Willington Dean and Oosburn. The terminus within the city of Newcastle was at Carliol Square, being replaced by the current Newcastle Central Station in 1850. In November 1844, the railway was absorbed by the York, Newcastle and Berwick Railway, and in turn became a part of the North Eastern Railway ten years later. Smith's Park opened with the Metro extension in 1982 and this name remained here until 1994 when it was changed to Meadow Well. Percy Main has had a station here since 1839, once serving the small clustered community around the Riverside Colliery. The station is also the closest to the southern terminus of the North Tyneside Steam Railway that runs for two miles, operated by the Stevenson's Railway Museum Volunteers. Please 
Our train crosses over the previously mentioned steam railway and pass under the A187 and finally the A19 for the last time. The site of Percy Main Junction was just here where the six and a half mile long Riverside branch diverged to serve the flourishing industries on the river's edge. It also arose to the proposers that this loop line would too serve small communities that lay far away from the main line. Trains began running over the branch in 1879, with delays being contributed in the scale of engineering works, as the line had required tunnels, bridges, cuttings, retaining walls and embankments for most of its length. After conversion to diesel multiple units in 1967, the service began to dwindle, with passengers being withdrawn in 1973, followed by goods five years later. We witness the staggered platforms once more here at Howden, serving a large residential area in the east of the city. The station first opened with the name Howden in 1839, but was eventually renamed in 1875 as Howden on Tyne, so it avoided confusion with the Yorkshire station of Howden on the Selby to Hull line. The suffix has now been officially dropped since the metro conversion. This is Willington Dean Viaduct, at 1,048 feet long, 76 feet high, and with seven segmental arches, was designed by John and Benjamin Green. A newspaper report in 1841 testifies that the viaduct's design had won the Silver Telford Medal from the Institution of Civil Engineers. Between 1867 and 1869, the viaduct was rebuilt with iron arches, all thanks to the designs of the engineer, Thomas Elliot Harrison. The bridge is now a listed structure.
Wall's End station is within the busy town centre, originally opened on the Newcastle and North Shields Railway. The train standing at Platform 2 is for St James. In further contrast to the Roman origins, the metro station has its public facility signs in Latin as well as English, the only example of a dead language ever to be used in the UK. Close by was the Segedunum Roman fort at the eastern end of Hadrian's Wall built under the command of Emperor Hadrian when he visited Britain in 122 AD and work started almost immediately by the Roman army to construct the 73 mile long wall. Nowadays the wall is protected by English heritage, deeming it the most ancient tourist attraction in Britain and a world heritage site. Here we arrive at Walkergate, another original station first named Walker until 1889, when it was then called Walkergate. It's the closest station to the Heaton Depot. The line now skirts around the bottom of the Heaton Track Maintenance Depot on the East Coast Main Line. It sustains the majority of Northern's fleet of Class 142, 156 and 158 DMUs in addition for stabling purposes to the LNER and Grand Central Express trains, normally for light maintenance and cleaning purposes. The curve in the alignment at Chillingham Road is where the metro branches off the formation of the Newcastle and North Shields Railway. The station had opened in 1982 as Parsons, as a reflection from the nearby Parsons Engineering Works. It was renamed Chillingham Road a few years later. Heading deeper back towards the centre of Newcastle, the line runs into a subterranean cutting before entering the long tunnel towards Biker.
We now noticeably encounter a rising gradient as we escalate from just below street level and onto viaduct over the Ousburn River, a tributary of the Tyne. The S-shaped viaduct is 815 metres long and 30 metres above the ground at its highest point. It was designed specifically for the Metro by Ove, Urup and Partners completed in 1979 and formally opened for services in 1982. The ginormous 8.2 metre wide spans are a prominent feature to the viaduct, being one of two main bridges for the Tyne and Weir Metro. Further Metro sidings are seen to our right. Also to our right is the single line connection from Jesmond, which we know is used to transfer empty rolling stock towards South Gosforth TMD. The train now descends downwards once more for the last time, remaining in tunnel all the way to the terminus. Manor Station is one of the quietest in the city, with a recorded patronage of 227,000 people using the stop in 2008 and 2009. Although it's convenient for the National Rail Station to be also called Manor's, there is no direct connection between them. Passengers must alight from the metro station and walk a short distance down the road. The diameter of the tunnels are 4.75 metres using mining techniques bored through boulder clay and lined with cast iron as well as concrete segments. Ironically, the system is called Metro, nearly 4 miles worth of the 48.2 miles are in tunnel. The yellow line arrives back here at Monument, the pretzel configuration now being witnessed from the driver's eye view. The information display screens must show some confusion to many a traveller who wish to go to South Shields, as it will display Platform 3, but this must mean the long anti-clockwise circular route we have just traversed. For a considerably shorter journey, passengers will need to go to Platform 1. We now slow for the approach to the terminus at St James, coming to a stop at the red signal here, protecting the road ahead.
we get the route into platform 2. This is the second terminus on the metro system to have two platforms, the other being at the airport. The station interior reflects its close proximity to the stadium of St James's Park, the home of Newcastle United Football Club. The club's colours of black and white stripes are painted throughout the station, also depicting various players and managers from the past and present. The stadium itself looms over the station, which does get busy on match days but passengers would not have been able to arrive here if it wasn't for their Tynan Weir metro system. <laughs> 